In this picture, one of these ladies is Sandra Walker, and she is a mother of two. She lost her husband in a car accident that also caused her to have a life-changing brain injury. At the trial for the accident in her court statement, Sandra said that she sympathized with the woman who crashed into them, who herself lost a child in the accident. And Sandra gave her a hug, and she said, I know she is going through just as much pain as I am, and I wanted her to know that I forgive her for what she did. This is Pascal Cavanaugh. She was a domestic violence survivor, and the woman next to her is her mother, and she thought she would never be able to reconnect with her mother because her mother was the abuser. During her adult life, however, in 2010, her mother suffered several strokes that left her unable to take care of herself. So with no one to help, the daughter began to sit by her mother's side and read to her every night. And all through this, she said the hate that she had for her mother disappeared and was replaced by forgiveness and love. When Jordan Howe was in high school, he took his stepfather's gun to school and accidentally shot and killed his friend Lourdes while he was showing off. Astonishing the judge and the community, Lourdes' mother not only forgave Jordan, but also asked for him to get the lightest sentence, telling reporters that she believes her daughter would have wanted it that way. Jordan only served one year in juvenile detention, and as part of his sentence, he now visits local schools with Lourdes' mom to warn kids of the dangers of guns. These are some of the most amazing stories of grace and forgiveness. Now, I wish I could say that I know for a fact that all those people are Christians. And it would actually amaze me if I heard that they weren't. But certainly they are examples of how Christians should live. Romans chapter 12 begins by asking a question. Since God has owed us nothing, and instead of uh, punishment, he has given us mercy, how then should we respond? In other words, how should we live as Christians? If you were side by side with an atheist or an agnostic or a Buddhist or a Hindu, how would we know that you were the Christian by watching your lifestyle? What makes you different than everybody else? What, what are the marks of a Christian? Paul gives us a few answers in this chapter. At verse 3, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. You know, Paul has spent a few chapters leading up to this, telling us how lucky we are to be adopted, how lucky we are to be grafted in, lucky to be saved by grace, when knowingly each one of us is a sinner. We don't deserve grace. Paul answers the question, how then shall we live as a Christian? We live as people who give grace. And admittedly, it isn't always easy to do this. So what can we do to more fully live out the words that are in this text? How can we, who have received amazing grace from God, turn around and now pass grace on to others? Let's look at one thing first that Paul mentions that stands in our way, and that is the comparison trap. Let's face it, most of us, we gravitate to hang out and be friends with people who are like us. You hang out and are friends with people that work because you both have the same job. You hang out with couples who have the same aged kids as you. You are friends with people who are at the same life stage as you, who are a Christian like you, believe like you, vote like you. Why? Because most of us are uneasy around people who are different. And differences create insecurity. And they keep us from giving grace to others. When someone has a different lifestyle than us, we get nervous and we'll say, well, that's not how I was raised. Ironically, all through their life, we tell people, be yourself, <laughs> right? And we encourage children. They can be anything they want to be when they grow up. We'll accept that. George Eliot said, never judge a book by its cover. But we do. 
People who don't look like us, talk like us, city folk, country folk, we're all different, but we are all God's children. Ephesians 4 says, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Matthew says, call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Psalm 68 says, father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. And we know this. We know this. We know that each person, whether they believe in God or not, was made by God, made in his image. We know that we are all God's children. But I'm his favorite. (laughs) No. If you find yourself having a hard time forgiving, a hard time showing grace, or a hard time uh, with your humor, because you always put this certain group of people as the punchline of your jokes, is it because they are different than you? You know, the, the comparison trap, it keeps us from extending grace. The comparison trap gives us the tendency to judge. And when we are judging, we are not like Christ. Comparison also makes us a very prejudiced people. And prejudice robs us of the ability to give grace. Without question, comparison nullifies grace. If we are to be people who can give grace and not fall into the comparison trap, we must remember that it was never God's intention that all his children look and act the same. Look at the rest of creation. Look around our own neighborhood. In our own neighborhood, we have deer that look majestic, and we have turkey vultures that we can't stand. We have rain, we have sunshine, we have grass, we have forests, we have flowers, we have weeds. There are 42 breeds of cats. There's 190 breeds of dogs. God made over 300,000 different species of beetles. Now, that might sound like overkill, but I think God just loves variety. Did you know that in one cubic feet of snow, there are 18 million individual snowflakes? And, And not one of them is alike. You can't tell the difference, but God can. To us, it's just snow. God notices because he created each one of them. God likes variety in us as well. If you ever had to wait for an airplane or you're standing in line at Walmart, you see all the unique and peculiar people. God made every one of them individually. When you look in a mirror, you're going to see how just unique and peculiar you are. So before we are able to demonstrate God's grace to the world, we have to rid ourselves of this toxic tendency to compare ourselves with other people, to judge one another. God made each of us as we are. What do Christians look like? What makes us different? We extend grace. We extend grace. Okay, enough negativity, enough talking about things that hinder grace. Let's look at the rest of this chapter and look at the positive things we do. We can serve, right? We can serve. Joanna and I used to be youth pastors at a Baptist church back in California. Actually, my wife was the paid uh, staff member. I was her lowly volunteer, and our high school students would enter in as immature freshmen to our program, and they were silly, and as they grew, they matured, both, you know, in their faith and, you know, as adults. And they would eventually come to us and say, what is the next step? How do I grow in my faith? What's after this, right? I I come to church, I read my Bible, I pray, now what? And our our answer to them was always the same. Serve, serve. Did you know that if you wanna get past those feelings where you compare yourself to other people, serve them. God loves them, so serve them. Well, I don't, I don't love them. I mean, I don't even agree with them. God doesn't say serve people you love. He doesn't say serve alongside lever, leaders that you love. The Bible tells us to serve. Romans 12 verse 4 says, For as in one body we have many members, and 
The members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of the other, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith. You know, we've been reading about God's grace to us for 11 chapters. So I don't think it's a coincidence that right after, now in chapter 12, we are told to go and now be like Christ to others. And if I asked you what grace was, said, you know, what, how would you define grace? You'd probably say that it was something about how God has shown grace to you. That would be your definition. But in that definition of grace, would you also talk about how it is now our responsibility to show grace to others? He served us. We are his hands and feet. We now serve others. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. 1 Corinthians 3 says, For we are God's fellow workers. Bottom line, we show grace when we serve others. What do Christians like, look like? What makes us different? We serve. And when we serve, we call that ministry. Ministry is the gift of God's power at work in us so that we can extend grace. Ministry is the gift of, God, of grace. It is from God through us to other people. Did you get that, that math equation? Grace from God through us to other people. Going back to verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Does the comparison trap creep into how we serve? Of course. You know, we look around, we see the jobs that are given to people, people who volunteer for things, and we, we compare ourselves against our fellow Christian. Hey, how come, how come they get to do that? How come you ask them to do that and not me? Why are they doing that ministry and I'm not? Why'd you guys ask them first? Paul shows us that God gives each one of us specific talents. He gives each one of us something for the body of Christ. We are not all the same. We are all different. Some have more, some have less. Some ha are really good at one thing, some are really good at a number of things. You know, if a church is super blessed, then you have that kind of Swiss army type person who can play drums and fix plumbing. If your church is a person like that, you are really blessed. <laughs> Look at the gifts that Paul lists. He lists prophesying. Now, there's two different types of prophesying, okay? There's the one that is when you foretell the future, right? But the most common one is when you just speak God's truth. You, you share God's guidance. You share God's will. Prophets in the Bible were people like Moses and Elijah and Daniel and Isaiah. Deborah was a prophet. Miriam was a prophet. Serving is next. Well, aren't all of these things serving? Yes, but there are some people who, no matter what you ask, they raise their hand. They're just like, yes, I am an able-bodied person. You know, they'll come up to you after church and they'll say, yeah, I don't know what y'all need around here, but I'm up for anything. We need those people a lot. Problem is, we don't all know how to categorize you very well. <laughs> best thing you can do is just keep looking for a hole to fill. You know, churches always have ministries. They always have needs. So when you're looking for some place to serve, just look around. And when you see something that you feel like, I could do that, then just jump in. One thing we all need is more volunteers. You know, when your pastor or your church leader stands up here and they're talking about ministries or they're talking about needing help, setting up chairs, tearing down things, helping out with kids, volunteering in the nursery, being a greeter, saying the offertory prayer, going out and visiting shut-ins, 
Don't think to yourself, I bet they get a lot of volunteers. At your church, no, they don't. They get a handful or zero. So if you feel God urging you in that direction, please volunteer. Your church needs you. Your church needs you. Teaching is next. Of course, right? And uh, we think of teaching typically by what happens right here, right? What happens on the stage? It's probably some sort of preaching or sermon, but we also have teachers that teach adult Sunday school or kids Sunday school, uh, youth. We have teachers in our ministries like Grief Share and Stephen's ministry. Teaching can take many forms. Encouragement is up there. That's another gift we see in the body of Christ. Encouragement is useful in counseling, in discipling, mentoring. Probably the best biblical example we have of this is Barnabas. You know, Barnabas' real name was Joseph. <laughs> but his friends all called him Barnabas because that meant son of encouragement. We see Barnabas in Acts. He comes alongside Paul after Paul is converted and he introduces Paul to the church. And then later Barnabas chooses Mark as a ministry partner, even though Mark had uh, deserted a previous ministry trip, which means Barnabas gave Mark a second chance. And all through Barnabas's ministry, he models this gift of encouragement, calling others to his side to help comfort them. And he becomes uh, an excellent example of Christ. Giving is another gift. God blesses somebody with finances or property or a mind that's financially sharp. Not only can they help support the church, but they can also give advice on investing and money management, expenses and budgeting and administration for the rest of the body. Leadership is up there. Churches always have leaders, many leaders, not just one, right? And whether you're a pastor or you're a board member or you're a teacher or a staff member or a worship leader, you are taking the responsibility of leading others leading the body of Christ. You make decisions that help guide and equip and shape and grow your church. The last one there is mercy. Those with the gift of mercy have this ability to sense hurt and then to respond to it with love and understanding. The mercy giver is kind and gentle. Mercy givers sense uh, the emotional atmosphere around them. The apostle John is a great example of someone in the Bible who has the gift of mercy. When Jesus is on the cross and he looks out into the audience, he tells John, take care of my mother. Mary and Jesus must have seen this gift of mercy in John. Can you imagine the level of grief that Mary is now gonna have in the next few days and weeks and years? Jesus must have known that John would have this gift to be present with her, to help her with empathy. Romans 12 verse nine. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Today is very consumeristic, right? We live in a very consumer-driven world. Everything is sold to you, whether it's toothpaste or the latest politician. And the way it's sold to you is by appealing to your dreams, right? This is going to make all your dreams come true. Or appealing to your desires. You want this. You need this. Selling is a big business. And unfortunately, Christianity is also something that gets sold to the public. But the sales pitch that's given is sometimes deceptive because it goes something like this. Become a Christian. Oh, wow. Become a Christian. And then when you become a Christian, you'll be accepted by your peers. You'll find a group of people who love you. You're going to achieve inner peace. All your questions will be answered. You know, there's no politics. There's no backstabbing here. We all just hold hands and sing Kumbaya. It's one big happy family. And when those misleading promises don't come true, people will just walk away from their faith. Their hopes are shattered. And it's not because God failed to fulfill a promise, but because 
The reality is, no, being a Christian isn't easy. So what is the truth? Paul says, be patient in tribulation. And he says, bless those who persecute you. So the truth, it's not easy. It comes with a cost. Jesus talks about the cost of following him. And he said that his followers would be hated, they'd be rejected, they would be persecuted. It's not easy to be a Christian, and certainly not all your prayers get answered. And every year, more and more, it seems like Christians become more hated, more rejected, more persecuted. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't bless us. God does. He blesses us here on earth. God can do anything he wants at any time he wants. And when he does bless us, it brings glory to him. And in bringing glory to him, we end up getting a little windfall from that. We get a little blessing from that. But this Christian life is not about what we can get on earth. It's about how we serve the Lord and serve well. And, and the guarantee that we get is not reward on earth. The guarantee is we get reward in heaven. Right now, this time, this is about sacrifice. This is about serving. And part of that servant's heart we see in verse 15 and 16. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. I love what Romans 15 or verse 15 teaches about Christian comparison. This verse is needed to remind anybody that we might be tempted to treat suffering with indifference or to approach hurting people as you're a broken person and you need to be fixed. But it says weep with those who weep. That's important. It's also a biblical command. And it reminds us, be thoughtful, be compassionate. Be quick to lend a helping hand. Be quick to be a shoulder to cry on. You know, we have two very powerful ministries here at this church, um, both Grief Share and Stephen's ministry. And I would say if you are walking through times of grief or needing counsel or advice, look uh, at your local churches and see if Grief Share or uh, Stephen's ministry is available near you. And then it says in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to what to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul says, don't be people who take revenge. But not just that, he goes even further than that. And he says, do good to those people instead. Wow. It's one thing to restrain myself from hitting back. It's quite another thing to do the exact opposite to people who hate me. You know, it's one thing to forgive the driver who killed your child in a car accident. It's a whole other thing to go before the judge and ask for leniency or to become their friend. And he even gives us some action steps. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. To give my enemy something to eat and something to drink means that I am actively seeking good for those who hate me. These words are so difficult to actually live that for thousands of years, we try to find all the loopholes. But authentic love leads us to pursue this kind of peaceful harmony with our community, even to those who are evil, even to those who hate us. Within these last chapters, or these last verses in chapter 12, what we read today, I want to look at four more things Paul says are also the mark of a Christian. Empathy. Empathy is what Paul is talking about when he says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Empathy is this ability to identify with somebody else, to be moved by their pain, to be moved to their joy, to take it on as if it were your own. And that isn't always easy to do. You know, your, your coworker 
gets the position that you're trying to get for years and they've only been there half as long as you, it's hard to be happy for them, isn't it? But we need to stop thinking of ourselves and our own interests all the time. And the only way we can do that is by allowing Jesus to change us. Jesus is our perfect example. Paul also says that we should be friendly, right? It's very implied there. Christians should be friendly. We should be people who other people can get along with. <laughs> and, and Paul is telling us, he says, live in harmony with one another. Paul is talking here about how we act, how we conduct ourselves when we deal with each other. We are not to act in a way that brings conflict. We are not supposed to be the people who bring conflict. We are not supposed to be the people who bring friction. If there is something going on in the relationship, we should not be the one who is causing the problem. Verse 16 even says we should be accepting. Paul says, associate with the lowly. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were intellectual. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Christ was the perfect example of this. He would talk to those who were considered to be the lowest of the low, the untouchable, the outcast. And through this, through his miracles, through his touching of them, he performed some of the greatest works. And it was God who got all the glory in those stories. Why? Because God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. One last thing Paul talks about is humility. We are to be people who are humble. We, talk, we talked a little bit about this last week, but I want to repeat it. Paul says, don't be proud. Don't be conceited. Back in verse 3, he says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. We are to be humble, period. Another good thing that is within us or anything that you know, comes from God, if you have been blessed by God at all, we cannot take credit for it. I cannot take credit for anything good. It is because God is good. It is because God is a graceful God. It is because God is a merciful God. I cannot take away any credit. All the credit and glory goes to God. At Walden Church, we say every member is a minister. And that statement comes from 1 Peter 2. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When Peter says we are a royal priesthood, he is saying that we are his ministers and we re represent the God of grace. And as believers, we are expected to pass on grace to others. You know, the secret to being a Christian is to keep God's grace always at the forefront of our minds. And if you can do that, then your grace that you extend to others will increase. When Peter says you're a royal priesthood, we are people who minister. We are people who extend grace. You know, if, if I'm thinking about God's forgiveness, keeping that at the forefront of my mind, then likewise, the depths of my forgiveness for others increases. Remembering that I have been shown grace, remembering that I have been forgiven, remembering that I have been accepted, remembering that I have been adopted, remembering that I have been grafted in. It makes it easy to minister, easy to show grace, easy to forgive, easy to accept and love others unconditionally. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder. For each one of these bullet points that Paul brings to light today, and as we think about these character traits of Christians, of what it means to be a Christian, of what it looks like to be a Christian, perhaps one or two of those things stood out to us and they were highlighted as a shortfall in our own life. We pray that 
you would help us to increase where we serve. May you increase our humility, increase our forgiveness, increase our knowledge of our own spiritual gifts that we might plug into a local church and serve. Lord, if, Lord, if there is some shortfall in this list, some area where I need your help, I pray that the Lord would come alongside us, equip us, and give us the ability to serve and to love and to extend grace more. We thank you for your blessings, for all you do for us each and every day. And we ask that you go with us as we represent you, as we are your royal priesthood. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for watching today. Thank you for coming out and sharing this moment with us. Of course, I want to remind you that we have church services every Sunday. We have services at 9.30 and 11. Our 9.30 service, we have a choir, we sing hymns, uh, we say the Lord's Prayer, we have communion. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary worship service. Come casual, come dressed, however you feel most comfortable. We also have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. You also want to make sure you check out our calendars because we have men's Bible study, we have women's groups that meet, we have support groups that meet throughout the month, and we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.